Well, good evening and hello. Well, before we start, maybe Christophe, you can start and introduce this session dedicated to To no, to no modulation. Good evening, everybody. I think we can start at the beginning of this afternoon. Some of you think it's a night session. Well, I, actually, the night has not fallen, but I'm a psychiatrist. I'm not an addictologist by trade, but in neuromodulation and in transcranial assessment, it is pretty obvious that the different protocols for treatment of addictions are very topical and uh, during the last congress of on brain stimulation in lisbon we had a number of presentations on addictions all troubles pertaining to alcohol abuse and he was uh, colin atlan was the uh, researcher of the year for her work on alcohol abuse. So this session is dedicated to neuromodulation, to deep TMS and OCD as a model for neuromodulation. We're going to listen to three speakers, one French speaker and two English speakers. Will you speak in French or in English? The answer is in French but this will be uh, translated into English for you. So we shall start by Bruno Millet, is a teacher in psychiatry at the Sorbonne University, is also in charge of a unit named Stokehead and is specialized in OCD as a model for neuromodulation uh, and in a specialist of those different circuits. So it's a privilege to have you as a speaker. Good evening, everybody. So we see today that the field of brain stimulation and neuromodulation has a hard time being represented in toxicology and addiction congresses. But we think this is going to change in the future because we think that those treatments with brain stimulation can be useful to the treatment of patients with addiction disorders. I have to say that I decided to start and draft this um, conference for this Congress by stating first the type of model that we're going to use. And in that case, I'm going to take the model of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. I listened to presentations this morning, also in the early afternoon during the session dedicated to the co-occurrence of PTSD and addiction. And by now, I suppose that you think that OCD are probably rather remote from addiction, but actually, I decided to draft this presentation to invite you and think about that disorder, which is potentially uh, less spectacular and less well known than addiction disorders. But then again, my conference is here to let you envisage that the model of OCD is actually an interesting avenue that we may want to explore because there are similarities with addiction disorders. And also I'm going to show that the understanding of OCD has improved quite a bit in the last years, thanks to the stimulation te techniques that I'm going to show to you. This is the outline of my presentation. First, I'm going to spend some time to uh, show you what is OCD. Then I will show you what is behavioral addiction and what are the similarities in physiopathology and in treatments. When it comes to OCD, 
you have to understand what that what matters most is uh, the uh, parasite force. Those are those thoughts that get into the head of the patient and they can get rid of that those sort of force. Can be the feeling of impurity, um, um, the fear of doing something that they don't want to do. So there's an obsession. And so there's a level of anxiety associated with the obsession for dirt or washing, for example. And what's pretty surprising when we try and envisage this disorder from a physiopathological point of view, there's a compulsion which is created, i.e., a stereotype excessive behavior that the subject feels compelled to doing, even if or she recognizes the uh, irrational loss of time and isolation that comes with that compulsive behavior. And so those persons are going to be trapped in this type of feeling, with consequences being isolation and being trapped in their compulsive behaviors. So do we know what do we know to date about OCD after 20 to 30 years of studying of physiopathology? But we know that this condition well, how can I define this condition? This condition is a lack of control over the thought process. And the subject with OCD have a hard time inhibiting their own thought process. So what crops to their mind are thoughts that they can't control and they emerge to their conscious. So they, you may say, well, that's the definition of thinking. Well, actually, no, because there's this uh, type of impossibility to repress those thoughts and, again, the impossibility to control um, the compulsive nature of the behaviors. Most, oh, I'll have a hard time with remote control, says the speaker. Uh, most studies show that what really um, is key in the type of condition if we compare healthy subjects and obsessive consultative disorder is a prefrontal activity. This is a study by Baxter in 1992. And about 20 years down the line, in, 12, uh, in 2013, my group was also able to demonstrate the same prefrontal activity in about 13 subjects with uh, OCD. So we see that on an individual basis. We also see that in cohort studies. And so there's a metabolic uh, prefrontal activity. However, it is not high enough to consider that type of test as a test that can be used uh, for diagnosis. So it's not used on an individual basis. However, it is a constant uh, red flag for OCD. So on top of prefrontal activity, we do see a high activity of basal um, ganglions. For this reason, we had a reflection on the physiopathology of OCD and the uh, different involvements of cortical and subcortical networks. So subneural networks that are integrated. So the integrated in normal uh, subjects and they help control motor activity but also control cognition and also control obsessive thoughts now starting from this and from those works on neuroimaging and physiopathology on those neural networks well in the same way we intervene on uh, subjects with motor uh, disorders for example Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease or uh, uh, hypotonia we thought that uh, we could intervene on OCD patient with also a number of treatment options and so this brings us to have a reflection on the different circuits that are involved in OCD. And so when we compare OCD and addiction disorders, we can say that those patients have a hard time making a decision. 
this is the case in uh, patients with addiction disorders, they also have a hard time controlling the inhibition. They tend to over-control the inhibition. Well, actually, we see exactly the opposite in um, persons with addiction disorders. Also, what we see is that those type of disorders have a long history. Well, initially, patients, when they accomplish those repetitive behaviors, just do that because they have an obsessive thought. Those washing the hands and the body do that because they have this obsessive thought that their body or hands are dirty or potentially contaminated. But as the disease progresses, the OCD uh, patient um, develops other reasons in the uh, back part of the brain and the procedure becomes almost automatic so much so that when we question patients with OCD and we ask them why they wash their hands or why they wash their body most of them say that it's because they're obsessed with uh, uh, dirt but the behavior is acquired is programmed and quite often it's almost irreversible. It's almost impossible to remove or suppress that behavior. What do we have in terms of treatment options in OCD? So uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh, that helps in treated obses obsessions. I think that those drugs are probably uh, the best ones that can reduce the frequency of obsessive Thoughts, but also we try to treat concoction. And so we try to have an exposure for prevention response. This is a behavioral technique. In a way, what we do is we propose those patients to be exposed to what they fear and to do their very best to avoid, for example, washing the hands because we know that this is a conditioning and it makes matter worse. Now, we have a number of assessment tools. The uh, best uh, known tools is the YBOCS by Goodmans. And you're going to see that in addiction uh, treatment, we also have a number of tools that are derived from that scale. Now, treatments of OCD. The other things than psychotherapy and drugs, those are the brain stimulation techniques. So maybe I should start with the most invasive, which when uh, helped in deriving RTMS, so an invasive technique, but you're going to uh, see a number of data on RTMS in obsessive disorder. In 2014, we published a paper in translational psychotherapy, and we demonstrated that, demonstrated that the repetitive transcranial magnetic simulation was helpful in reducing the obsessive uh, disorder. You certainly know that the team from Israel uh, coordinated, if I'm not mistaken, by Abraham Zangen, who's going to be the next speaker, and supported by a company named Brentsway. So they developed the use of deep RTMS. So RTMS applied thanks to a specific technique with a helmet, thanks to which you can go in depth and reach some structures that are specific, like the singular contact, cortex. And this team demonstrated the efficiency of deep RTMS in a paper which was published in 2018 in brain stimulation. And you can see on the uh, x-axis the time, and on the y-axis, the change from baseline. When you compare subjects with uh, OCD and some are stimulated, while others just have a sham stimulation, while you compare both lines, you see a significant difference, which is shown as early as week four. So we have a number of arguments, thanks to which we can say that uh, transcranial magnetic uh, uh, stimulation is efficient in OCD. In OCD, also what changes the, uh, the pathology is 
or improved knowledge of high frequency deep brain simulation on the subthalamic nucleus on the one side on the one hand this is a paper that we uh, see uh, in uh, this uh, new england journal of medicine in 2008 but also the stimulation of uh, the incumbents when we uh, stimulate the ventral striatum we can uh, considerably improve the symptoms of patient with OCD. So again, the physiopathology is rather sophisticated, different treatment options. And by the way, I'd like to say a couple of more, uh, more <laughs> a few more words about deep stimulation. This technique is the only one on ventral stri striatum or on the subthalamic, thanks to which we can have the uh, um, we can have the OCD symptoms completely disappear. Hence, the interest and the influence of a type of stimulation on deep cortical brain structures, which brings me to something that I know less, which are uh, behavioral addictions. However, I asked myself a number of questions on subjects with uh, addictions, which we call without substance. And I took an ex as an example, the gambling disorder. The symptoms from a clinical point of view are rather similar with on the one hand, of course, not an obsession, but uh, a preoccupation with monetary gain, an interest, attraction for fi financial gain, which translate into anxiety, and then we'll see later distress, and then compulsion for gain, which brings the um, subject to excessively use games also uh, to their own harm. And there's an obsession and a craving. We were talking about craving this, mo this morning. And this, in turn, is going to create this vicious circle where those pathological gamers uh, enter. Uh, so they lose money, they become desocialized, and then they're trying to make, make up for lost money. And again, they are again trapped in this uh, behavior and in this addiction creating behaviors. I had a look at what is available in literature on gambling dis um, disorder. What we read again are those difficulties in decision making, a difficulty in controlling inhibition. And this is apparently what we see in this paper in 2016. Also, they mentioned delay discounting. So uh, this is this task where you can discriminate whether you're an impulsive type of person or whether you have a good control in order to uh, delay something if you know that you're going to have a higher gain rather than a lesser gain if you get that immediately, if this makes sense. So when we take this uh, discounting task, we realize there's no difference between individuals with gambling problems before and after treatment. Hence the uh, question of whether it's interesting to uh, apply the same type of treatments to OCD patients and gambling disorder patients. We see that there are more and more uh, patients with gambling disorder. We know that dopamine and serotonin are involved as they are in OCD, and the same reward circuits are activated. And again, they are the same, but are activated at the beginning of OCD. Now, progress is similar to that that we see in OCD with a chronic phase and a number of relapses. I had a look at what treatments are available, and you see that, well, in the first phase, there's an abstinence from gambling, where we try to remove the player uh, from uh, environments in, in which we feel compelled to play. Then there are, of course, uh, opiates or opioid receptor antagonists, for example, <laughs> 
naltrexin and nalmethine, but also uh, paroxetine or fluvoxamine, the same that are used in other um, conditions. There's no market authorization uh, in the States nor in Europe for this type of, of use. And uh, there's also cognitive behavioral uh, therapy, which is also used in order to help patients develop strategy and manage their urge to play. I had a look at what's been published on brain stimulation data or scars, and it shows that the effects seem to be interesting, but meta-analysis do not demonstrate any significant difference between the standard of care and uh, brain stimulation. Last comparison of OCD with another type of addiction, a type of addiction with a substance. And in that case, I decided to use the um, to use alcohol as a substance of abuse. The problem is the same than what we have with OCD. It starts with a, a, an attraction uh, for alcohol, for the supposed um, disinhibition of potential, but then this attraction transforms in a craving. And instead of getting an attenuation of anxiety and concern, it is going to make matter worse. And very quickly, the drinker enters this vicious circle, which is almost impossible to break. So they are concerned and obsessed with drinking, anxiety, craving, and then a compulsive uh, search for alcohol with a host of deleterious impacts that come with that. Uh, well, uh, loss of money, loss of money, desocialization, uh, or social isolation, forensic uh, difficulties, or difficulties with the law, and also uh, destruction of the cortical and subcortical um, structures when they are dependent, or subjects are dependent to alcohol. Specialists use different tools that are very um, uh, similar to what we see in OCD. There is uh, an obsessive compulsive drinking scale that is widely used when we try to appreciate the impact of uh, a treatment and also the obsessive compulsive drug use scale. The, uh, the course or the progress is rather chronic with uh, a sequence of uh, remissions, but also uh, relapsing spells. Now, there are beautiful papers on physiopathology of addiction, a number of papers we are eagerly waiting for. For example, the paper that is about to be published by Alain. But I would like to point the paper by Nora Volkov, which demonstrates, uh, of course, the involvement of the uh, reward pathways, but also the different networks that are involved, taking into consideration uh, anticipation and um, interception in those subjects with a problem with alcohol abuse. But then again, there's always the involvement of cortical, subcortical, and uh, ventral striatum. Now, the interest again of uh, brain stimulation. We realize that brain stimulation may have an interest, especially in uh, territories for which we know there's an involvement in case of alcohol abuse. For example, in a functional MRI, we see that a significantly higher signal-induced signal activation of the dorsal striation in heavy drinkers compared to social drinkers. So that sentence means that in a functional MRI, you see exactly the same sort of thing that we see in OCD. So when the drinker is under the spell of alcohol, the um, repeat behaviors are going to become irrepressible and they are going to have this obsessive preoccupation for getting the product. 
alcohol or to have thoughts coming to the conscience that are going to be uh, again obsessive. Now, I'm getting back, a I'm getting a few slides back just to uh, show you that a number of uh, treatment options are available in the case of uh, substance abuse. And I'm sure that Abraham Sanka is going to do his uh, studies. So I'm going to concentrate on a clinical case. The patient is sitting on a chair with the helmet on his head, and this is his history. He's 48 years of age, he's an electrician, divorced, father of four uh, children, uh, has been dependent for six years, uh, his father was an alcoholic, he died of stomach cancer, and one morning the poor chap discovers his best friend and colleague who hanged himself in his workshop. And this person had been an alcoholic for many years. The trauma was such, and this is a statement by the, by the gentleman, the trauma was such that it caused me an almost instantaneous trigger to take alcohol and, and drink as much as one bottle of whiskey per day. So it's almost like suicide, right? Uh, he saw his friend hanging himself because of alcohol, and he fells in the same type of a pathology. And so he describes the social isolation that has followed. We that was two years ago. We proposed 20 sessions of deep, deep RTMS. Today, the patient is sober for 226 days. So is that to demonstrate that it is a miracle therapy? Well, maybe not, but it may help in that the helmet is the helmet that is used in OCD. It is targeting a neuroanatomical structure, which is the anterior cingular in the medial prefrontal cortex, which are targets that are very important in OCD. Now, can we say that this technique, in the same way it helps in OCD, is it also able to suppress and remove those intrusive thoughts uh, compelling the um, subject to drink alcohol? I'm not going to go as far as that, but it's certainly very interesting. And when you look at what is done in matters of high frequency deep brain stimulation, well, there are a number of methods of deep brain stimulation for alcohol addiction, for uh, dependency to uh, cocaine as well. But there are limitations, limitations pertaining to the device. This device comes with a cord, and so you need electrodes that will be on the ventral striatum or on the uh, subthalamic nucleus. And to stimulate those areas, you need to uh, use those electrodes that are located, uh, connected to a battery outside of the device. So of course we are expecting, we have high expectation for a micro battery that would be connected directly to the electrodes or other types of stimulation, for example, ultrasounds that could potentially improve those techniques. Now, before, before I wrap up, I'm under the impression that those neurostimulation techniques uh, should be developed in the field of addictions. I hope that uh, I uh, uh, elicited some curiosity for those in the public. I wanted also to point out to the neuroplasticity induced by RTMS. We could demonstrate that that neuroplasticity was dependent uh, on brain activation at the moment of stimulation. And I think it's important that the uh, subject is made aware to the problem of uh, dependency. A number of cell recording studies have shown that brain circuits are all the more ready to change when they are in a period of electrical discharge. So this is something that we need to study 
in more depth before we generalize the use of those techniques. So then again, it was just awareness raising, and I wanted to uh, draw your attention to the continuity and contiguity of symptoms. And there are similarities between obsessive compulsive disorders and addiction disorders, the uh, motor disinhibition, the uh, compulsivity, compulsivity, uh, are those actions that uh, are inappropriate to the situation, but the uh, user, or rather the subject, is impossible to repress. And there are, of course, a number of undesirable consequences. I already mentioned those in my presentation. So the, those are pictures of uh, my research team, uh, a research team in neuroscience in the uh, Brain Institute that I have the honor to coordinate at the Hôpital La Pitié Salpetière, but also the Saint Antoine Hospital in Paris. And so we work on those topics and I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Que certains réfléchissent à une question à poser éventuelle. Moi, j'en aurais une en, en deux temps à te poser. La, la première, je reviendrai sur le, le modèle du TOC. Et, et je me souviens. I would like to go back to the model of the COD. You a specialist of DBS for OCDs in uh, hard discussions on the choice of the target, where in the case of a brain stimulation with the ultra precision of stimulation. And the first studies, none of them was approved by the FDA with RTMS, with focal reels. There were several choices of targets that were distributed between the addition, the prefrontal cortex, etc. A discussion on the choice of the target. Do you think that when we have a tool like H7, which is going to target contemporaneously several targets simultaneously, is it part of the solution or it has nothing to do with it? It's the argument given saying we're going to stimulate more neuroanatomic targets to have uh, more a better effect. This is, but in deep uh, brain simulation and RTMS, the more precise you are in the forget, in the target you're going to locate, and the more you're going to find the, the, the adequate treatment. In other words, we need to customize a simulation. This is why we have developed a neural navigator, and this is the reason why we insist a lot on the need, when we can, to use a neural navigator. I would say that the strength of Brainsway today is not the exact location of the target, but its cap capability as an electromagnetic tool to go more in depth toward the subcortical structures. And today, it's the only technique which can enable you to go uh, in the subcortical region. The other technique of a deep, uh, high frequency, deep uh, brain simulation, it's an invasive technique. And today for patients, who it's not that simple to propose a surgery to patients suffering from OCDs or addictions, because we know that many other factors are going to enable them to stop. So I'm in favor of more precision as to the neuroanatomical target so that you are as precise as possible on what we do with our patients. Thank you for your answer. Are there any other questions in the audience? If not, I have a transition from one inventor to another one. Among, uh, among the founders of Sineica a company, they uh, market a neural navigator, Professor Abraham Zengen, who is an inventor of the H-Call uh, system, 
He's now a professor of neurosciences at the Ben Gurion University. He, he has worked a lot on OCD and also on addictions. And there is there are similarities. And with the H coils, uh, there were many uh, FDA approvals recently in OCD, uh, a tobacco addiction, and we expect with the Lisbon after the Lisbon uh, Convention, we think that uh, next FDA approval will be on alcohol addiction. So I give the floor to Professor Zangen. Thank you for participating in this seminar this afternoon. Hello, uh, everyone. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay. So uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, conference. And I'm really sorry for not being able to attend in person due to, due to the situation in, in Israel. I will talk uh, about uh, the development of uh, brain stimulation uh, to the treatment of addiction and uh, talk about the history, uh, starting from animal studies that we have uh, been doing uh, for 15 years and still doing now to understand better mechanisms of how brain stimulation can change the neuropathology in animal models of addiction and uh, how this was eventually developed into a regulatory approval, FDA approval uh, for addiction uh, in the smoking field. And I'll tell you also about uh, new studies that are uh, just being uh, now going to be published about the effects of stimulation on neuronal connectivity in humans uh, and al alcoholic uh, patients uh, to try and understand better the mechanism of how multiple sessions of brain stimulation can affect the neuropathology of alcoholism as well. So first of all, just about the theory that we first uh, uh, put uh, forward in 2007 in an animal study, the idea that brain stimulation can change uh, pathological circuitry in addiction uh, was actually inspired by someone else. Uh, uh, his name is Bill Carlson. I was working at that time at the National Institute of uh, Health in the NIDA, National Institute on, on, on Drug Abuse, uh, with Roy Wise. He was like the deputy director of the place. And his former postdoctoral fellow, uh, Bill Carlison, showed uh, before I came there that uh, when you do brain stimulation reward, if you, you just implant electrodes into rats and do you know, brain stimulation rewards, what rats would lever press to stimulate themselves uh, because it produces very strong rewarding effect. And then if you look at the molecular changes in these animal models, some of them are actually opposite from the molecular changes that are induced by various addictions and particularly cocaine exposure. So this inspired the idea of perhaps if we stimulate the brain reward system repeatedly, we might induce uh, opposite effects of what the addiction processes inducing over time and thereby maybe change addictive behaviors. So this was the idea when I came back uh, and established my uh, my lab at the Weizmann Institute in Israel, I came back from my postdoctoral fellowship after four years in the United States, we started this uh, study. And uh, if you really want to know more about possible mechanisms of brain stimulation altogether, not just in addiction, we wrote a, a very comprehensive review about this, uh, several reviews that you can look here, how, uh, what underlying mechanisms can, can, can cause uh, long-term changes in excitability or synaptic plasticity and even myelin plasticity. I will talk about this a little bit at the end of this talk, how we show by uh, diffusion tensor imaging, uh, myelin plasticity even induced in alcoholic patients and when we get to the end of my talk. Um, another concept that I must introduce in this, uh, in this talk is that, uh, that prior to stimulation, if we activate the relevant brain networks using provocation, uh, like cue-induced memory recall in post-traumatic stress disorder, or in the case of addiction, we induce the craving. If we activate the pathological circuitry of, in OCD, if we activate the obsessions, then 
we are more likely to affect the pathological circuitry because it's known from basic science studies, many of them, even in our, in our cultures, that uh, stimulation can change the circuitry of multiple neurons when the circuitry is active. When it's resting, it's less likely to induce la long lasting effects. So in order to really change the circuitry, you need to activate it and then it's more liable for change. It's easier to change it when it's active. It's like easier to change a memory after you recall it, right? You can't change the memory of something without recalling it first. So these are the issues that are as an introduction for my talk. And of course, I need to mention in the case of addiction, the areas that are most, uh, you know, repeatedly in many studies showing uh, to be activated in uh, response to cues that are you know, causing craving. So any for various addictions, cocaine, alcohol, smoking, or any addiction, heroin, we always see uh, either the insula or the medial prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate cortex as areas that are activated uh, in functional MRI studies uh, following a, a presentation of drug use that are correlated with the increase of craving in, in the patients. Okay, so now going back to the animal studies, just as the, uh, from the history, that's the first study we did, we used a very simple model in rats, which is called the psychomotor sensitization model, where uh, when you uh, inject rats, uh, cocaine or amphetamine repeatedly. And then uh, after two weeks, like say we you, you, you inject it for one week um, in a certain dose, and then you leave them at their home cage and you can take them back after one or two or three weeks and test the effect of the same dose of cocaine or amphetamine. And you see a sensitization, increased response to the same drug. Uh, so we know that multiple sessions of uh, most drugs cause actually tolerance, but the sensitization in the psychomotor effect is a very interesting phenomenon, particularly in stimulants. You see like increased motor response to the drug after multiple sessions. Now, we use this model in order to check uh, whether 10 days of stimulation using uh, TMS-like patterns of stimulation in red. So here it's implanted electrodes using the same patterns of temporal patterns of stimulation like with TMS, 10 Hertz or, or higher frequencies in trains, every day, 15 minutes of treatment, and then test whether the psychomotor sensitization, simple motor effect is attenuated, changed. And we also checked these brains and looked for this uh, uh, biological measures like the AMPA receptor, the GLUA1 particular, which is interesting because it uh, uh, more the, the more GLUA1 you have, the more penetration to calcium. But let's look first at the behavioral effect. And here, when the stimulation was applied for 10 days in the lateral hypothalamus, that's where you have brain stimulation reward most effective in rats when they press the lever to stimulate themselves. So we treat them 10 days in that brain reward center, the for brain, uh, brain stimulation reward. And what we see is actually that those that were treated with active stimulation versus sham, the sham was just implanted electrode, but with zero current, no real stimulation in the rats. So we see that the sensitization is higher. Actually, we induced a greater psychomotor response to the same cocaine drug. These two groups here are seeing cocaine for the first time, active or sham. Uh, stimulation, but they see it for the first time. These are two groups are pre-treated with cocaine for a week. So after two weeks, we put them back in the, into, the, uh, into the test, we inject the cocaine. So this is a psychomotor response. Of course, it's a stimulant. These are rats that are addicted already, higher response, but those that received 10 days of stimulation had greater psychomotor response. That means actually we didn't improve their addiction. We actually caused deterioration. So this is going against any you know, idea of treatment. It's actually sensitized their response to the cocaine. However, when the elect was implanted 
into the prefrontal cortex, not the lateral hypothalamus, where there's many fibers of passage in the of the reward system. When it went just to the prefrontal cortex, then we got an opposite effect, where the active stimulation attenuated, reduced the response to cocaine versus the sham. So here we have already a signal that maybe a prefrontal cortex is a good target for stimulation, 10 days of stimulation using TMS-like patterns in a rat model. This was also accompanied by some interesting changes in the biochemistry as we measured by in the nucleus accumbens, particularly in the anterior part of the nucleus accumbens shell and the anterior part of the ventral tegmental area, where we found changes that are opposite uh, in the areas in the rats that were receiving the active treatment versus the sham treatment relative to what happens during the addiction process in these proteins uh, in these brain areas. Now, a more intuitive model is just using rats that can lever press. They press a lever to stimulate themselves. We uh, implant uh, an electrode to the brain, but also into the jugular vein, where there is a cannula each time the rat presses the lever, it activates this pump and they become addicted to cocaine. And each time they press the lever, also there is a light and a tone. So there is some Pavlovian association and the rat learn very fast to lever press for cocaine. Now the question is now in the test, when we remove cocaine from the syringe after 10 days of stimulation, the same patterns of 10 days, it's two weeks. When I say 10 days, I mean five days per week for two weeks, 10 sessions of half hour per day of treatment with an implanted electrode, are they going to increase their cocaine seeking behavior or decrease it? So what we see here in both groups of rats, both implanted with electrode into the lateral hypothalamus or the prefrontal cortex, we find a reduction in their cocaine seeking behavior. So we attenuated the cocaine seeking behavior when cocaine is not on board in the test day. After they become addicted, we test how much they press for cocaine. But a different type of test where they do have cocaine in the, in the, in the syringe, but we test their motivation to consume the cocaine by what we call the progressive ratio schedule. That means that each time for another cocaine dose, they need to press more times the lever. So for the first dose, they press once. For the second dose, they already need to press three times. For the third dose, 10 times, and it goes up to 200 times uh, of lever press just for a single cocaine dose, and they sometimes just stop, they are pissed off. They are not willing to work so hard for just one cocaine injection. And what we measure here is how much they are willing to work for cocaine in the progressive ratio test. And here again, when the electrode was implanted to the lateral hypothalamus, there was a sensitization. Actually, they were willing to press more, up to 250, more than 250 times, just for one cocaine injection relative to the sham. But when the treatment was performed into the prefrontal cortex for 10 days, then again, we did receive a reduction in the motivation for cocaine. So we already have two indications from two different behavioral measures in rats that prefrontal cortex is a good target for stimulation using TMS-like patterns with implanted electrodes, like with DBS, but not a constant stimulation, just half hour per day. Now, the final slide I will show you in animals is new, much newer. It's a, it's a new study in my lab. Uh, there are many studies since then, but I want to highlight just a few uh, um, findings from this study. It's a more complicated model for addiction where we test relapse of the rates. So here the rates are trained to lever press just like before, but we then introduce an electrical barrier next to the lever. So there is a safe zone in the cage, but the rat, in order to receive the, the, the cocaine to, to, to press the lever, they have to go over an electrical barrier. So first we train the rats without any electrical barrier, but after we introduce the electrical barrier, we can find for each rat, what is the intensity of the shock that will cause the rat to stay in the safe zone and avoid the cocaine, like the, the the red say I can pay $50 for cocaine, but not uh, $500. Okay, so for each red, we find this threshold of what 
intensity will make the rat uh, abstinent and decide I, I'm stopping to be addicted and stay here for half hour during the session without even going once. Now, after we find this abstinence threshold for each rat, we, uh, we induce the Q-induced craving. We put the light and the tone associated with cocaine, okay? I forgot to tell you when they are trained, they receive the light and the tone. So we flash the light above the lever, we produce the tone, and then what we see is relapse. The rat goes back over the electrical barrier and press for cocaine. So we here we have a, mod a model to measure relapse. Now the question is whether we can prevent this relapse by TMS or by in this case implanted electrode using TMS-like patterns of stimulation in the brain. And we target the prefrontal cortex in two areas, the prelimbic or the infralimbic, that's more superficial, that's more deep into the prefrontal cortex of the rat. And we see behaviorally that we could induce relapse rates. This is the sham, relapse rate is over 80%. In the prelimbic cortex treatment for 10 days, we get a reduction, which is not significant. In the infralimbic, which is deeper layers of the prefrontal cortex, which have more projections to the nucleus accumbens and other reward areas, then we do get a, a very significant reduction in relapse rates. In this case, we also had electrophysiological measures. It's a more complicated study where the electrode can allow you to measure activity in the brain during the sessions. Uh, we don't have single units here, but at least local field potentials found, tell us a little bit about the mechanisms of, of what's happening here. If we measure the power of the, the delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma waves, uh, during the session with the light and the tone, when they have the craving versus a session that uh, has no light and tone, we can measure how this Q-induced craving change the activity in the brain. And basically, I will just tell you that in this group that was effective in the infant limbic group, we see that there is an increase during the session when the Q and the tone is presented in the low uh, waves like in delta, theta, and alpha waves are increased in their power. This actually indicates reduction in activity in the infralimbic cortex because of the stimulation. So our stimulation were, was able to reduce activity in the uh, in these deep uh, prefrontal cortex areas, and this reduction of activity, or at least increase in the low uh, wave powers is maybe associated with the reduction in addictive behavior or the reduction of relapse. So this is what we have so far in the animals that I wanted to show you. And now the translation of all these studies to humans. So the first uh, study we did in humans actually was before we had uh, the approval for this specific age coil, the deep TMS coil. Uh, we used a simple figure eight coil in smokers. It's much easier to recruit smokers so we wanted to translate our animal work, original animal work in the humans with smoking addiction. Uh, so we had uh, subjects that uh, were trying to quit smoking and failed previous attempts. We used the same frequency that we found to be effective with implanted electrodes in the red, 10 Hertz daily sessions for, se for, for several weeks. And we measured both subjective report of how much cigarettes you take, objective, uh, it's also important always to take urine samples and measure cotinin, which is a metabolite of, of um, nicotine. And we had this provocation of symptoms. In the red, the provocation is there, but let's leave the reds here. Now we are doing the provocation by producing, showing them smoking pictures or later videos that are provoking the craving for the cigarette. So we had in the sham group, we had either neutral pictures or smoking pictures with or without provocation, also in the real group with or without provocation. So these are four groups, two basic groups, active and sham stimulation, but also looking for the effectiveness of provocation. How will this affect the treatment? So 10 days of treatment, just like what we did in the reds and four groups of subjects. And here is the self report. You see before, an average 30 cigarettes, a pack and a half in a day in these uh, subjects is reduced 
in all groups, both receiving sham or active stimulation. No matter if they had cues or no had cues, like if they have the provocation or not, it was a very disappointing result altogether, although it looks like with those, with the active uh, treatment together with the provocation, we had the best reduction, but it's not very significant. Altogether, we see very nice reduction because these are all subjects that are motivated to stop uh, smoking. They come and after 10 days, they smoke less, fine but no difference between the groups. However, when you look at the urine samples, look at the cotinine levels, you see that actually it's only the active groups, those receiving real stimulation, reduced cotinine levels in their urine. So this is a very interesting, you know, uh, conflict or discrepancy between what they report and what you measure in the urine. One of the explanations for this, you know, they are all motivated, they are coming 10 days and being very, involved in the study and therefore they would it's a wishful thinking that they actually reduced the uh, smoking but the other explanation that we found is probably uh, it's not just like self deceit of, of themselves they are not lying to themselves and to us i think it's not just that it's also that we we learned from a few examples that subjects are even in the sham group they are really smoking less cigarettes but they smoke it much more to the end, they inhale more. So they less smoke cigarette, but each cigarette they smoke all the way to the end, they inhale much more. So altogether the cotton in the urine is not really reduced, although they smoke less cigarettes. In the active group, it was really a reduction. The only problem in this study was that there was no quitting. There was just a reduction in the number of cigarettes. The problem we know is that after some time, if you just reduce the number of cigarettes and you don't quit altogether, you will eventually go up to the to the original level of your smoking. And after uh, six months of follow-up, there was no difference between all the, the three groups at all. So this was with the figure of eight coil. At that time, then we already developed the deep TMS coils to affect also the insula and much deeper into the prefrontal cortex. And here uh, we see that, uh, uh, so we had a, a new study with uh, uh, active or sham stimulation with or without the cues. So we see here with or without the cues for sham. In this case, we added also one Hertz low frequency of stimulation and the 10 Hertz. So we had altogether six groups. And you see that the reduction was very nice in the 10 Hertz group, particularly when you have it in combination with the cues. This is now when you have a deep TMS coil, H4 coil targeting both the prefrontal cortex and the insula. And the cotinine levels also here, sorry, this is the cotinine levels. This is what you see here is the self report. So the red group is again, the 10 Hertz plus the cues had the best reduction. And most important here that we did get some quitting, particularly in this group receiving the 10 Hertz, not in the one Hertz, the 10 Hertz stimulation together with the cues, although there was a reduction also without the cues. So there was some advantage to adding the provocation, but there was some effect also without it. And if you look at the quitting rate, complete quitting zero cigarettes after three weeks, you see it most important, most you know robust, in this group receiving the 10 Hertz, uh, just as we had in the reds, right? 10 Hertz and uh, half um, and less than half hour per day altogether. And then we see close to 40% uh, quitting. And after six uh, months, this is only by far not by cutting in measures, we still see this group, uh, you know, very salient, the 10 Hertz plus the provocation. So this study that was published in biological psychiatry was the basis for a multi-center study. We took this results and said, now let's do a large study with many centers around the world and see whether active versus sham stimulation will be effective. Just taking the 10 Hertz with the provocation versus sham with the provocation and see the effects. And these are different centers around the world that was involved in the study together with Mark George in the United States. We had two groups, 10 Hertz and Sham. So active and Sham with both of them with provocation, smoking exposure procedure, 
And uh, we had 12 sites all together in this study and recruited 427 subjects uh, eligible starting really enrolled is 262 uh, subjects. Heavy smokers look at this, there are 27 years or 26 years in average of smokers, very heavy smokers that tried to quit several times and failed different medications or gum. Uh, so 60% of them failed at least three attempts to, to stop smoking. So these are heavy smokers for many years that were not able to stop smoking by simple, you know, means of drugs, medications, or anything else. In average, they had all uh, about a pack per day, 18 cigarettes per day in both the active and the sham group. And here we tested in a multi-center study with FDA regulation, the, whether we can replicate our original biological psychiatry paper. And indeed, the results were positive and led to FDA clearance for the H4 core targeting prefrontal cortex and insula uh, in smoking addiction. Although if you look at the results, they are not very, you know, not uh, very promising. They are very good in terms of active versus sham. You see the difference is very clear in any measure. If you look at the ITT or completers, the short-term effect, after three months, and this is always caught in measures, with objective measures. So you see very clear difference between the active stimulation and the sham in this multi-center study, but the rates are not very great, right? You see here about 25%. That's, uh, that's uh, basically the amount of patients that really were quitting for uh, three months, three months plus the original three weeks uh, they, they had four uh, uh, grace period in the first two weeks. So we're talking about three, three and a half months of quitting. Uh, and this was very clearly different between active and sham. And the continuous abstinence is very nicely, uh, you know, presenting just those who are uh, not touching a cigarette, even a, 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 a one cigarette is already considered relapse. So we're talking about complete clean uh, subjects complete quitting, and this led to the FDA approval. And this is already an, uh, 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 um, an existing treatment in many countries. And um, maybe soon we'll even be reimbursed in the United States, just like for depression. Most interesting in this study was that we were able to predict who is going to quit and who is not going to predict uh, to quit uh, in a post hoc analysis of the craving measures. We had a craving measure, which is very interesting. We had different types of craving measure, but the most simple one was how much do you want a cigarette right now? And so we did it in a visual analog, score, analog scale. Uh, before we have a baseline, how much you want a cigarette, then we do a cue induced uh, craving and ask him how much you want a cigarette now. Then we do the stimulation. So we have one, two, and three, uh, visual analog scales questionnaire. And you see that, of course, the Q induced the craving produce. So the second is after the Q induced craving produces some, some craving. And then after the stimulation, in average, those receiving active stimulation had a, uh, had a reduced uh, craving relative to the sham. So both of them, because of the time, has a reduction. But relative to baseline, we see that those receiving the active stimulation are lower in their craving versus the sham. But interestingly, what we predict, we find in the prediction here is that we can, based on the reduction of craving following the stimulation, we know in the first session already who is going to quit or not for some, you know, not, not one by one, but for very significant uh, level of prediction. So the greater the effect on craving was in the first session, the greater chances for the subject to be a quitter after three weeks of treatment as measured uh, by the cotinine and objective measures. And here you just see that the reduction in craving at baseline in the first visual scale is, is true also for the sham group, but is stronger for the active group. Uh, three weeks, every day you see a reduction in the craving, but again, in the first session already, the reduction in craving following active treatment 
can predict the quitting of the particular subject. This was a very interesting finding as we published in World Psychiatry 2021. Now, the last uh, topic that I'm uh, talk about is now the more, uh, you know, the newer studies we are doing in alcohol addiction. So this is done in together in collaboration also with Markus Helig in Sweden. He was based um, previously the clinical director of, neuro of uh, uh, alcoholism uh, in the United States in, in NIH. And uh, so this was a consortium that we had uh, uh, sponsored by, by uh, Horizon uh, 2020. Uh, and uh, we tested both the uh, coil that is targeting the insula, particularly the insula, not prefrontal cortex and insula, but more directly to the insula and some of the ventolateral prefrontal cortex, but also not the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, it's the H8 coil. It's not the H4 coil that we had for smoking versus the H7 coil, which is the one we, you heard about and is using used for OCD treatment, already gained FDA approval for OCD treatment. So we tested two different sites, the same protocol in those studies, two different sites of stimulation, the same type of protocols as we had in the smoking, just other targets in the brain. And uh, these are the numbers, so the two different studies we had uh, 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 subjects, uh, that are wishing Nous avons des sujets stop uh, drinking. Uh, we had exposure to uh, alcohol cues in both of them. The same 10 hertz uh, sessions uh, and 20 minutes uh, treatment per day with uh, 3,000 pulses. And then we followed them up for three months to see how much of them relapse. Of course, many of them will reduce their drinking as always in these studies. The question is whether they can maintain uh, without uh, drinking. So we also have urine samples and biological sampling to have objective measures of whether they are uh, really uh, stopping, uh, they stopped the drinking for those who, who uh, report that. So these are the two studies. And again, with the smoking cues, they always are, we are pouring the alcoholic beverage that they like into the glass. In front of them, they smell it, they can't drink it. We put it on the table in front of them along the session. So they have this strong provocation during the session every day while they get stimulated with either the age eight or the age seven coil. So here are the results for the age eight coil, which were published in our psychopharmacology. And we see very disappointing results. Of course, there is a reduction in the heavy drinking days. What we measure is the percentage of heavy drinking days. So there is a reduction. They are all motivated to stop, but this is gradually going up through the 12 weeks and three months of follow-up. And there is no difference between active or sham. On the other end, with the H7 coil, that the one that was approved for OCD, this one did show a separation between active and sham. You see this reduction again, just like what we had in the insula study. In the medial prefrontal cortex HCC H7 coil, we see also again this strong reduction in heavy drinking days following the three weeks of treatment. And then this is still down in the active group, but it's going up, up, and up. So during the three uh, months, as uh, we have altogether five follow-ups, this is three months five, and five visits, a uh, gradual increase in the heavy drinking days in the sham group. And this separation is still statistically significant. Uh, also, if you just measure the craving, you see a reduction and then up again, but in the active group of the H7 coil, we see that it's remains to be lower relative to the sham, particularly in the three months. So this is the three months follow-up. This is during the three weeks of stimulation itself. There is clearly a reduction in craving as they reported in the uh, pen alcohol craving scale, the PACS. So the PACS shows the reduction in both active and sham group, but this is continued to be re reduc reduced during the three weeks of stimulation. And even for three months, it's basically not going up very strongly in the group, but in the sham group, it's gradually uh, increasing the craving. So this is going together with the behavior and the amount of alcohol they drink. Here you see the grams in grams, how many, uh, how much alcohol per gram per week they drink. And you see the sham versus the active group during the three months of follow-up 12 weeks, 
is lower in the active versus the shunt group. So we have a good signal here that targeting the uh, prefrontal cortex, media prefrontal cortex, and, 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 uh, and anterior cingulate cortex as a positive site for treatment of alcoholism, not the H8 call with the, uh, with the um, insula targeting. So we also had the question how much we really engage the target in this uh, insula, because there's a lot of evidence that insula is involved in alcohol addiction. And based on functional MRI studies uh, that we did in the same subjects, the same alcoholic subjects, we measured them before and after the three weeks of the treatment. And what you see here clearly is that there is target engagement. We do see a difference between the sham and the active TMS. Here we just look at uh, in, in the, the connectivity between the insula and some other brain regions like left preconeus or uh, right cingulate gyros. And you do see <clears throat> that with the active group is the versus the shunt group, you see changes in connectivity, which indicates that we did affect, we did, we were able to target the, the insula, uh, but without any efficacy in terms of clinical outcomes, craving or clinical uh, outcomes of alcohol, heavy drinking days in the uh, subjects receiving active uh, versus the sham. In the case of the uh, H7 coil targeting the anterior cingulate and, uh, and, 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 and medial prefrontal cortex, uh, we see changes in connectivity uh, in the active group, which is actually showing reduction in connectivity between the medial prefrontal cortex and subgenual anterior cingulate cortex, a reduction, while in the sham group, there is a tendency for increase during the three weeks of treatment. So we just compare baseline and after three weeks in the fMRI connectivity. So we see that there is a reduction in the active group in the connectivity in functional connectivity. Also between the uh, dorsal, uh, those are part of the anterior cingulate cortex and the caudate uh, nucleus. There's also a uh, reduction in the active group uh, relative to what we see in the shunt group during these three weeks. So we have two biological changes that are induced following three weeks of treatment, which might be associated with the clinical effectiveness of this uh, manipulation. The last thing, which is not yet published, that I will just tell you briefly because of the time is about what we learned, and this is not published yet, uh, from the data on the DTI, diffusion tensor imaging from the same study. Just one note as an introduction, we know from diffusion tensor imaging that there is a, a reduction in fractional anisotropy uh, following alcohol withdrawal. So during alcohol withdrawal, and even during alcoholism altogether, there is some decrease in fractional anisotropy, which means reduction in connectivity, reduction in, in myelin uh, in, in, in many areas of the brain, okay? And this is also true in, in animal models. We know it also from alcohol drinking rates. There is a reduction in fractional anisotropy, which is indicating uh, some myelin problems in, in the brain, some uh, loss of connectivity between regions, okay? Now, uh, we were able to replicate these findings in our study showing without even connection between, you know, active or sham, we see that between the first- Ab uh, Abraham, the, so, sorry, two, two minutes left. Would you mind to, to conclude? Yes, I, I, will do, I will do it in, in, in one and a half minutes. So just we see, we can replicate these findings showing that there is a, a, a reduction in fractional anisotropy, which is uh, uh, also was suggested to be related to contribute uh, to relapse vulnerability. And the finding in the active versus sham is again, very interesting. From the area of stimulation in the prefrontal cortex, this uh, you know, reduction in myelin plasticity in the sham group was arrested and prevented by deep TMS. So deep TMS actually were, was able to restore or to avoid the reduction in uh, you know, myelin plasticity uh, following three weeks of treatment. So this is now indicating another mechanism by which the repetitive stimulation can uh, change the you know, pathology of 
of the uh, of alcohol addiction. I will skip this and just go to the conclusion slide. So what we learned is that why the H4 coil targeting the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and insula is effective in smoking addiction and was also FDA approved. It has no support for efficacy of the H8 coil targeting the insula for alcohol use disorder. Uh, maybe the explanation is that there is no uh, enough stimulation of the uh, stimulation of the insula. Not all of it is involved in the stimulation. It's very hard to really stimulate much of the insula with even with the H8 coil. Another uh, explanation could be that we need the dorsal prefrontal cortex together with the insula together in order to affect addiction, at least as we found in the smoking study. But there is a very positive promising signal in terms of H7 cord targeting the medial prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate cortex for alcohol addiction. And uh, we hope to, to replicate it in a multicenter study, just like we were able to do with the H4 coil for smoking. And uh, hopefully we will establish also a good treatment for alcoholism with regulatory approvals, as we already have signals in a nice uh, study with more than 50 subjects and some indications of replication of this in some group that we, uh, we, we are collaborating with. I want to thank all the people involved in these different studies, including Mark George in the smoking study, Marcus Haley um, uh, in the uh, alcohol studies, Santiago, uh, Santiago Canaz uh, is the DTI expert, and uh, all my group uh, and other people that I collaborate with. And thank you for listening. Sorry for taking a little bit uh, longer. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Merci pour cette présentation très intéressante. J'aurais deux courtes questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. I have two short questions. One technical question. And actually, we talked about this when we were in Royan years ago. Another way to do dip TMS with a double bo uh, coil, um, double cone coil. Well, with regards to comfort, it's different. The double cone coil is quite painful uh, at certain intensities. So could you explain about the comfort issues? I, I already uh, asked you several years again. Uh, you, you can do tip TMS with uh, double coil, coil, but it's painful. Yes. Or, or do you explain simply uh, why ice coil is comfortable? Yes. So first of all, uh, it's important to say that uh, with the double cone coil, you cannot reach as deep as much as you can with the H coil. The, and the main reason for the different uh, in pain is that uh, in the case of the double cone coil, there is an intersection between the two uh, you know, loops, which produces a strong field and at uh, the intersection. And then this field decays over the distance and therefore you need a high intensity to reach deeper. In the H coil, the structure is much more distributed the whole, whole idea of the H coil is that you stimulate larger volume by distributing the wires in the structure of the coil. And therefore there is no local high intensity on the scalp. In one point it's more distributed around the scalp and therefore you both can reach deeper and it's also less painful because you reach the target from different angles around the scalp. So altogether, it's also deeper, it's stimulating larger volume, which might be sometimes a disadvantage for uh, research purposes, but for clinical use so far, we also know in depression that this larger volume of stimulation is less focal. Uh, it's also more effective in uh, depression. Thank you. So my second, is oh. you go d'autres des questions? Are there any other questions? Uh, maybe one question, uh, Abraham. Uh, when you say that, if, if I understand well, the, the, the H call, which works in, uh, with Revel Tobacco, is the, the one 
which targets uh, insula, but not a CP uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So how do you explain this discrepancy between you both results between uh, the H4 and the H and the H8 uh, in that sense? Yes, so uh, I, I just want to make it more accurate. The H4 is targeting the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the insula, okay? This is a very large coil producing stimulation of both dorsolateral on the way to the insula. On the other hand, the H8 coil that was used in the alcohol study was designed following, uh, you know, the consultation with Marcus Haley to avoid the stimulation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in order to study more direct targeting just of the insula. And this was the one who failed. So the explanation we may have is that we need probably the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex as part of the circuitry to affect in order to get a clinical outcome. And if you avoid the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, you only stimulate the insula as we did in the alcohol is not enough. It's probably the, the answer. The other option is because the insula is very deep, we are only stimulating the part of it. We don't, based on our, uh, 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 the field maps that we measure in pantom brain, we can see that we can reach the insula only towards about a third of it, not the full capacity of the whole insula. So these may be the two reasons we can explain why it did not work in alcohol, but it did work in, in uh, nicotine addiction. There is also another explanation, of course, that alcohol addiction and smoking addiction uh, has some differences. Although in both cases, we do measure craving, we see the effect on craving, but uh, maybe there is some differences in the circuitries why the H4 maybe could have been effective, uh, uh, not effective even in, 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 in alcoholism. So there are many reasons to explain the discrepancy between the two studies, but what we have a signal for sure is actually with the H7 coil, right, in alcoholism. Does it mean that that will be the last question? Does it mean that uh, the the more precise, the more accurate you are in the uh, in the targeting of the of the neuroanatomic uh, structure, the, the 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 best results you obtain? Uh, is it your position? Uh, I don't. Well, no, I, I don't <laughs> think so. Actually, no. Actually, actually, my position is that you need to. To, uh, to affect a very large circuitry and repeatedly every day in order to make a change because the brain is much more elastic than plastic. It will always go back to you know baseline. And in order to make a change, you need something more like an ECT, an electroconvulsive you know, treatment like type of approach. You, you don't, you never get an effect in depression with one session of ECT. You need multiple sessions of ECT stimulating the whole brain. So you need to target larger volumes uh, and many nodes in the circuitry in order to induce a lasting change following multiple sessions. So being very accurate and specific in your targeting may be interesting for research, but for a clinical outcome, you actually need to stimulate larger volumes and more parts of the nodes involved in the pathology. Okay, thank you very much, Abraham. And I wish you all the best because I know that in Israel, uh, the, the time is difficult. And uh, so we wish all, all the best to your nation and to you all the citizens. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. And now we're going to give the floor to Dr. Derek Blevins, who's working in New York. He's a professor at the University of Columbia, and he's an addictologist and psychiatrist. And his field of expertise and research is again RTMS related to addictions. And he's going to tell us about cocaine, cocaine uh, uh, use. Uh, they're excellent. I don't know if it makes my job easier or harder, but I will be optimistic and say easier. So I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about some of the evidence of using TMS for cocaine addiction, um, the evidence that exists so far, and then um, uh, some potential future applications, um, including a, a grant that uh, or a study we have funded but have not yet started. 
So some of the objectives, so some of the theoretical basis, which I will go through a little bit more quickly to make up time, and since it's been covered in the previous two talks, the evidence to date for TMS for cocaine use disorder, cocaine addiction, and then finally, the possible future of TMS in cocaine addiction treatment. So this was an image that um, the first presenter showed that uh, talks about the different circuits involved in addiction or substance use disorders. Um, and I think it's a helpful thing to think about when we're looking at potential targets, uh, TMS targets to treat addiction. Um, of course, the, the three elements of this circuit, one is this binge and intoxication phase. This is how a person begins using substances. This is often followed by what is called the withdrawal or negative affect phase where someone just uses the substance to avoid the negative feelings of not using. And then finally, when you develop sort of the true kind of compulsive uh, aspect of addiction, the preoccupation or anticipation phase. And if you look at different potential targets for TMS based off of uh, the types of coils that are available, the depth and the specificity, there are a couple of different uh, potential targets that uh, stand out that have been discussed uh, so far. So one is the medial prefrontal cortex that's involved uh, in cravings. Another is the insula, and then a third would be the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And I put the question mark there because it, there's some uh, um, conflicting information about how uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex modulates craving, that the medial prefrontal cortex does seem to be more important for craving, but there is some, uh, some aspect of craving mediation. And then a second thing would be to look at restoring executive control, so like restoring the cognitive control, this sort of top-down um, uh, thinking. And this can be done by targeting the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, again, perhaps more importantly than targeting it for craving, as well as the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. And then a third, uh, the third uh, sort of element of this uh, addiction circuitry is potentially managing the negative emotional state and stress response. And I think that the answer to this is really by um, improving the, the craving and executive control, that these brain areas that are affected um, in this withdrawal and negative affect um, uh, part of the loop are uh, deeper brain structures that are not really possible to target directly, but may be uh, targeted by um, through one of these more superficial brain structures. So as a, a kind of overview of where the literature stands right now with substance use disorder, so um, some of the studies that have been done have elicited craving, many of the studies. So this is what has been described as cue-induced. Um, most of this has been visual, but it can also be um, uh, a smell. And the idea is to prime the brain before TMS. So put it in the state um, that it would be in um, when it's uh, the, the most sort of dysfunctional. Um, and other studies have used TMS at rest, so not necessarily exposing the participant to a cue. And the thinking here is maybe but this uh, regulates this executive or top-down control. Uh, all or ma the majority of the studies to date have really shown that high-frequency stimulation, which we sometimes call excitatory stimulation, um, as opposed to low-frequency, which would be inhibitory, has really yielded the most consistent positive clinical results for addictions, um, despite some of the theories that low frequency may actually reduce hyperactivity in some brain regions in addiction. And this was uh, the, the uh, studies that have been done looking at OCD. This is actually the initial sort of theory of why um, low frequency TMS targeting this hyperactive brain region in OCD may be more effective, but actually the low frequency group was no different and the high frequency group um, was the group that improved. So when they did the follow-up multi-site study, they, they didn't include the low frequency group at all. Um, and there are no FDA uh, cleared protocols using low frequency stimulation. Um, the two types of coils that have been discussed, so the figure eight is more, I, I said selective, I should say probably more focal is a better way to describe it, um, but is more superficial. Um, so targeting maybe two centimeters uh, into the cortex after it passes the skull. And then H coils are less selective. Um, they, they stimulate a broader region, but also deeper, maybe around three, cent three to four centimeters uh, into the, the uh, cortex. Um, and both of them have been used to treat substance use disorders with pretty similar prelimin preliminary results. Um, this, the, this talk of target engagement has been mentioned, um, studies using target engagement, so that can include looking at functional imaging, structural imaging, um, oh, sorry, not structural imaging, functional imaging, whether it's uh, fMRI or resting state, um, EEG and neuropsychological testing, and the idea is to better understand the mechanism, and this is obviously a very important um, thing to determine, um, but it does add complications when doing uh, clinical trials research. 
Um, this is a difficult patient population to recruit, difficult to keep them in studies, and certainly difficult to uh, obtain a pre and post uh, fMRI, for example. The trials to date uh, for FDA clearance have not demonstrated target engagement, meaning that to get the FDA clearance, they did not um, have to demonstrate target engagement. So this is another way to look at some of the brain structures that have been discussed. Um, this was a, um, a paper that uh, talked about some of the trials to date, but the reason I wanted to include it is, I oh, went back instead of hitting the light, sorry, is um, thinking about the depth of stimulation. So when we talk about the figure eight coil versus the H coil, this is a very important, uh, a very important uh, concept. So we see that many of these potential uh, brain regions are within that um, 10 to 30 millimeters, so uh, a few centimeters um, within the skull. So some of these, many of these brain structures can be targeted with uh, figure eight coils, but others like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex here um, cannot. So the, this is where the um, H coil comes in. And then we also see the other brain regions that are important for addiction, like the ventral um, striatum, uh, it cannot be targeted with any of the currently available uh, TMS coils. Um, these are so, so the studies that have been done to date um, for the targeting the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex include alcohol, cocaine, and methamphetamine studies, the medial prefrontal and dorsal anterior cingulate, alcohol and cocaine primarily, and then the insula uh, alcohol and cocaine studies. So I'm going to kind of summarize the, the studies that have been done for cocaine specifically, and I should have said at the beginning, why do I feel like cocaine is an important um, uh, thing to study? And well, because we have no available, really uh, available effective uh, treatments for cocaine use disorder. Um, so many of these studies, or all of them on this slide, have been done in Italy. Um, there are sort of a, a combination of uh, sham controlled and non sham controlled studies. You can see that many are fairly small sample sizes, as low as 16, the highest 147. Um, and generally, I, I put in green the positive findings in these studies, and then in red, what I would say are the negative findings. So you can see that targeting the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex seems to reduce cravings for cocaine. It does seem to reduce uh, cocaine use, mostly looked at by um, uh, urine samples. There are a couple of studies that also showed that it improved mood and anxiety or mood and sleep in uh, patients that it use cocaine. One of the more recent studies, though, and what, what I put in red here, um, was a study that showed that it did, did reduce craving, but the dropout rate was extremely high, which is not uncommon in cocaine use disorder studies, but it makes it very complicated and difficult to use this sort of treatment paradigm um, for this particular population. Um, they also did not show a difference um, in urine testing in this particular study, but they did show that both groups reduced their uh, cocaine use uh, by self-report. A couple of other studies that have targeted the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, just to mention, um, one used what's called intermittent theta burst stimulation, which is a different uh, type of stimulation that is also thought to be excitatory. Uh, and they showed also that they reduced their cocaine use and reduced the amount of money that uh, were spent. Again, a relatively small study without a, um, a sham. And then finally, the H1 coil, one of the, the brain's weight coils that is approved for major depressive disorder, um, there have been a couple of smaller studies. Um, one, the initial uh, outcome showed that there was no difference co in cocaine use, and they looked at treatment by time. When they did a secondary analysis, they actually showed that people in the active group did reduce their cocaine amount, uh, amount that was used, and this was uh, looking at hair analysis after three months. And then another study, again, showing uh, reduced craving. So the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex certainly looks like um, a good target for cocaine use disorder. Larger trials are needed. I think you'll hear me say that a lot. Um, and um, it seems to be somewhat clear that people are uh, reduce their cocaine use, but um, we need more, more trials to better understand that. The second uh, target that I'll mention is the insula that we've heard about for the uh, smoking cessation uh, trial that uh, did re receive the FDA approval. The only study that I'm aware of that um, has uh, use the H4 coil, actually just compared the ITBS to high frequency, so they didn't have a sham control group. The idea here really is that ITBS can be done in a shorter period of time, and you may be able to do multiple sessions in one day, so it may, um, it may reduce the amount of time that someone is actually in treatment, um, and essentially what they showed is comparable reductions in consumption um, and craving. 
So we don't really know that much about uh, the potential for targeting the insula, um, and certainly we need more trials to better understand that. And then the last brain target that I'm going to mention, and then I'll talk some about uh, the uh, study that our group did and the study that our group will do, is targeting the medial prefrontal cortex and the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. Um, so this is the, the OCD uh, coil uh, that has been FDA approved. Um, a group in South Carolina, Colleen Hanlon's group, did some of the initial studies looking at targeting the medial prefrontal cortex specifically using uh, one of the figure eight coils. Um, they actually used inhibitory um, uh, stimulation or the, the, the what's CTBS is continuous theta burst stimulation. And the, the uh, participants were at the same time in an MRI machine so that they could sort of follow the where the stimulation was going, what was happening in the brain. They actually didn't show any improvement in cravings, which was disappointing, um, but they did show changes in the ventral striatum that they were expecting by targeting this specific brain region. And then finally, the um, study that uh, Diana Martinez did at Columbia University um, for her lab, part of our group, um, used the OCD coil and looked at uh, three different, I had three different groups, high frequency, 10 Hertz stimulation, low frequency, one Hertz stimulation versus sham, and this was a different uh, type of study uh, paradigm than we've seen so far in that it was a human laboratory, human laboratory setting with non-treatment seekers. And I will talk a little bit more uh, in detail about that. But what they demonstrated in this study was that um, the high frequency group did reduce their drug choice for smoked cocaine. And this again was among non-treatment seekers. Um, interestingly, there was no changes in craving. So we've heard before that it does seem that reduction in craving at least mediates, moderates, um, the reduction in substance use, but we didn't see that in this particular study um, and still saw reduction in uh, choice for uh, cocaine. So the summary for the, the, MP, uh, the medial prefrontal cortex and dorsal anterior cingulate, uh, the medial prefrontal is certainly important for cravings. It's very difficult to target with the figure eight coil due to its anatomy. It's sort of, you put the, the uh, coil right in front of the eyes basically, and it, it can be quite painful. And this sort of larger brain area, the medial prefrontal cortex and dorsal anterior cingulate is certainly seems like a good target for both craving and potentially improving executive control. Um, one thing that uh, hasn't come up yet is the word seizure, even though that's the biggest risk in uh, TMS treatment, although it's very low, less than 1% um, of all TMS sessions. Um, but this is something to, that we have to consider when we're talking about substance use. And um, one of the studies that was presented about alcohol use, they actually, uh, the participants were discontinued if they had a relapse. And that was about 10% of the participants in the study. So it's not an insignificant problem to be dealing with. Um, certainly when we're talking about cocaine, we're not talking about uh, uh, withdrawal seizures, but there is some potential risk related to cocaine intoxication. And this will just come up when I talk about um, a, a new study that we've uh, designed, but have not yet started, have funding for, but have not yet started. So this is the um, H7 coil looking at um, the three different groups, high frequency, low frequency, or sham. Um, and again, this was non-treatment seeking participants. So these are people that do not want to stop using cocaine. Um, they are um, receiving some sort of financial uh, reimbursement for their time that they spend in the hospital and in the research hospital. Um, so they're actually admitted for a month. Um, and they had a total of 13 H7 coil RTMS sessions um, versus sham. So they, they're admitted to the inpatient unit. They have three to four days of monitored ab abstinence. Then they come down for um, what's called a choice for cocaine session. This is before they have any TMS. I'll show what that looks like on the next slide with the paradigm for it. Um, they have four RTMS sessions, so either high, low uh, frequency or sham. They have a second choice for cocaine session. And then they have the, the remainder of the TMS sessions, which is the, the additional nine. Uh, the 13 it would ideally be 15, but it was not done on the two days where they had the choice for cocaine session. And then they're discharged from the inpatient unit. This is what the, the session looks like. So they first come down at this negative 40 minute mark. They have about 40 minutes to do some initial um, types of assessments around craving and such. Then they have this priming dose where they're actually given a dose of uh, smoked cocaine for free. 
Um, and then they have these what's called choice for cocaine sessions at 14 minute intervals. So they're even either given the choice to receive an, an additional dose of cocaine, smoked cocaine, um, or a $5 voucher. And at the time the study was done, $5 was uh, worth a little bit more than 12 milligrams of cocaine. So the choices are weighted to the $5. Um, and the outcome measure in this type of trial is the number of choices for, co for cocaine, which ranges from zero to nine. And what we saw in this study was that the choice for cocaine decreased in the high frequency group um, with a significant group by time uh, effect. There was no effect in the low frequency or sham groups. And the significant difference was actually observed between uh, sessions two and three. So there was no significant difference between session one and two or one and three, which is kind of interesting. And could discuss why that might be. Um, this is when comparing across sessions in the high frequency group. So uh, high frequency RTMS reduced cocaine consumption between session two and three, um, which occurred after days uh, or four and 13 days of TMS respectively. And what this demonstrates, it's a small, so it's a small N, right, 13 participants, um, but it demonstrates feasibility in this patient population it certainly seems that low frequency stimulation is not going to have an effect, which we've seen in other uh, types of studies for different, uh, different diseases. And this preliminary signal that high frequency TMS could reduce cocaine intake in individuals with cocaine use disorder. So then the next step would be to translate this to an outpatient clinical trial in treatment seekers, so people that, act, that do want to stop or, or reduce their cocaine use. Um, so this is our trial that, and I put this coming soon to not get too excited. There's no data yet, but maybe I can come back hopefully in a few years and give you some of the data. And what we'll do is um, augment uh, a kind of uh, standardized CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy with RTMS um, targeting the uh, medial prefrontal and anterior cingulate cortex. So again, no FDA approved treatments. The medial prefrontal and dorsal anterior cingulate are involved with learning, predicting likely outcomes of goal-directed actions and executive control. And we know from lots of different neuroimaging studies that these brain regions are altered in people with cocaine use disorder. Um, there have been studies that show that reduced medial prefrontal cortex activation during the Stroop task, which me measures cognitive interference and response inhibition, is associated with faster cocaine relapse rates. And poor cognitive functioning generally is associated with poor outcomes in CBT for cocaine use disorder. There have also been study, studies that show that uh, greater improvement in drug stroop performance, performance, which is a measure of attentional bias, so attention uh, toward or away from uh, the particular drug or substance, uh, is correlated with more computer-based CBT engagement and longer within treatment cocaine abstinence. And again, our uh, study looking at non-treatment seekers demonstrated um, uh, some effect in the high frequency group. So the, our hypothesis is that combining the H7 coil with CBT may enhance executive control and response to CBT. Um, this is what we're looking for in this trial. So this is primarily looking at feasibility and safety. We wanna see if these people come in and get uh, at least an adequate number of TMS sessions on an outpatient basis. Um, we're going to be looking at me mechanism using um, fMRI and the drug Stroop task, um, and then finally efficacy. And our benchmark that we set was at least 15% of participants achieving uh, abstinence uh, during the trial, which sounds like a low bar. But if you know uh, the cocaine uh, treatment literature, that's about where uh, uh, the, the highest uh, um, efficacy stands at about 15% of people achieve abstinence. So this is a UG3, UH3 study design. It essentially means that we have a small study, we'll enroll, enroll 30 participants, have more in the active to sham group, and we'll be looking at this feasibility and safety. If some of those milestones are met, then we'll move on to um, a larger trial of 84 participants, one-to-one uh, -one double-blind randomized uh, controlled trial looking at efficacy. Um, we'll have an initial uh, fMRI. They'll have three weeks of daily high-frequency RTMS. One other thing to mention in the human lab trial, the motor threshold, which is the, the, um, the way that the amplitude or the intensity, the energy setting of TMS is determined was much higher in co the cocaine using population than in the, the depression or uh, OCD groups. So what happened in that trial was that at 100% of their resting motor threshold, they were uh, literally jumping out of the chair and the protocol had to be uh, modified and and we're going to reflect that modification in this trial that will start at a lower resting motor threshold and not go above 100 uh, percent which is the OCD um, approval as well then they'll have a follow-up fMRI 
And then that will be followed by 12 weeks of CBT. Um, I mentioned this concern about uh, seizure safety. This is a, a is it has been a challenge and will be a challenge as we're starting this study. And I just think, again, it's important to think about how um, uh, you know, translating from a human lab setting to an outpatient clinical trial to then um, the clinics. So in this trial, patients will be excluded if they're heavy drinkers, if they've had any prior alcohol or sedative withdrawal, and if they use any sort of GABAergic drugs um, like GHB, uh, other benzodiazepines, um, or amphetamines in addition to the usual exclusionary criteria like a seizure history. Um, the resting motor threshold will do once a week, so that uh, ideally will reduce the likelihood of a seizure. And then each day we will have them um, uh, do a breathalyzer to determine if they've used alcohol recently, um, we're checking vital signs to see if they have any withdrawal symptoms, a timeline follow back to see if their cocaine use has increased or if they've used other drugs that could put them at risk for a seizure and urine toxicology screening. If any of those things are positive, the physician may need to make a determination to either um, repeat the motor threshold that day, so repeat the determination of the energy setting, or would actually skip that day's uh, TMS session. And then, of course, we'll have this as a, a seizure protocol in place uh, using intramuscular lorazepam. And again, the likelihood of seizure is quite low. Um, you know, these are not assessments that are done when someone comes into a clinic for depression or OCD treatment, but is something we have to think about um, for protection of human subjects um, as we're studying this. So some of the things that we expect to be challenges, so one is recruitment, um, and this may be where we have to potentially modify some of the exclusionary criteria around alcohol consumption, because we know that it's quite uh, comorbid, uh, I think, around the world, but in particular in our population in New York. The concern about noncompliance, so coming into the clinic five days a week um, for 30 minutes or an hour um, may be a, a challenge. We will be reimbursing, uh, participants can earn up to $1,250. Um, for completing all the assessments, and we'll have some additional reimbursement for um, completing each one in a week and then completing all three weeks. Um, we'll have an additional week where patients can come in and make up any uh, of the sessions that were missed. Um, and then for CBT sessions, they can be doubled up, which is not really as much of a concern what we're talking about. Um, the tolerability question about the intensity of the TMS. So again, reducing that initial uh, with a target of 100%, but sort of a minimum of 80%, and this was informed by the human lab study. And then the big question is if it's ineffective and how we would potentially move or, or modify this protocol moving from the UG3 to the UH3 phase, um, and one of those may be to increase the number of sessions. You know, the depression and OCD literature, four to six weeks of daily treatment, that is a difficult thing to achieve in this patient population. Um, so, we, we, but it may have to be modified if, if the treatment appears to not be effective. So in summary, TMS of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex using both the figure eight and H1 coil have demonstrated some efficacy uh, for treatment, mostly showing a reduction in craving. The medial prefrontal cortex and dorsal anterior cingulate have de demonstrated efficacy in non-treatment seekers for, for cocaine choice in the human lab setting which is a, generally thought of as a high bar. These people are not interested in reducing use. Um, cocaine addiction results in significant dysfunction of brain regions responsible for top-down control, which may also lead to non-response or limit improvement with therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy. So TMS preceding CBT may result in some improvement in those top-down deficits and improve the responsiveness to CBT. And I think that there are really some possible um, opportunities to combine TMS with other types of therapies, whether it's psychosocial therapies, um, different types of psychotherapies, sort of depending on what the, the um, theory or hypothesis is of how it works, um, and potentially of combining it with medication treatments, although for cocaine, that um, it may be a bit more complicated than thinking about combining with, uh, say, uh, disulfiram for alcohol use disorder. Um, the two more generally thought of more effective medications for cocaine, so pyramid and anti-seizure medication, which could potentially impact the effects of TMS, and then amphetamines, um, which may increase the risk of, of seizure. And then finally, as I said, I would say many times that we really need larger controlled uh, trials to really advance this as a potential treatment for what is a, we know is a very refractory substance use disorder. All right, made up for time.
Merci beaucoup. Uh, Derek, uh, peut-être vous pouvez prendre le casque. Thank you very much, Derek. I think the headset is going to be useful because we're going to ask questions potentially in French to you and also to Abraham Sangen. Do you have questions for our colleagues here on stage, but also remotely? I have a couple of questions, personally. I'm surprised to read the number of studies which have been conducted. You mentioned that some of our studies are without a control group. And you do not say whether those are randomized control trials. So are they randomized control trials without a control group? Why is it so difficult to have a control group? Is it difficult to include cocaine users in uh, control trials? It's a very good question. Um, you hear this microphone, yeah? Okay. Um, so I think that the answer to the first question is that most of those trials have been randomized control trials without a control. There are some exceptions. There was a lot, the larger trial that was done in Italy that was around 150 participants um, was a sort of naturalistic trial that wasn't randomized. Um, but most of those trials have been randomized um, just without a control. Um, why they didn't use a control, I guess, is a, a good question for them. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a difficult, uh, it's a difficult treatment to study. Um, like I said, it takes a lot of time, right, but for the participants, um, and there are not, um, uh, I mean, there, there are uh, a good shams for the H coil anyway that uh, maybe Dr. Zengen can uh, speak about some too. Um, and the figure eight coil, though, I believe my understanding is it's harder to create a sham control. So the H coil, the sham exists within the helmet. Um, the, uh, it, it stimulates the scalp in a very similar way, um, but doesn't reach the brain or at least very, uh, very shallow into the brain, if at, at all. Um, and that's more difficult to, to uh, simulate, I think, with the figure eight coil. Et, et chose que je remarque, the other uh, thing I notice, um, wait, 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 <laughs> the other thing I notice is, that, is for studies on, so again, for cocaine users, those with a dependency to cocaine, you say that they are non, they are not seeking drugs, so they are not seeking cocaine, which means that their dependency to cocaine is lower, right? Sorry, I missed the very beginning of that. But if you're talking about that I'm sorry, Michel. Trial that we, we the, performed the, the trial that you are going ah. to, to to perform. And I noticed that you 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 want to uh, include patients who are not non non seekers uh, uh, addicted uh, cocaine. Uh. Right. So the, so the initial trial, the human laboratory study, they were participants that were using cocaine but were not interested in treatment. Okay. Our our clinical trial, outpatient clinical trial, will be people who are using cocaine who are seeking treatment. It's almost a psychotherapy, an augmented psychotherapy. Would you say that? Would you, would you like to have online psychotherapy uh, session while they also have RTMS, so at the same time? Or don't you think there's a rationale for that? So psychotherapy and RTMS at the same time. Yes. Um, so um, if you've sat in the TMS chair um, and had stimulation done, I, I think that uh, you would understand why it'd be difficult to engage in psychotherapy. Uh, there certainly is an argument for the order and when psychotherapy would be administered. And um, whether it's at the same time that the person has TMS and that maybe then they have a psychotherapy session immediately after TMS, or if it's done during the actual TMS itself, as you're saying. This would have to be done in sort of 10 second increments, right, or 20 second increments um, in between the trains. Um, and I think creating that type of uh, psychotherapy uh, paradigm would be challenging. In, in, uh, in Nijmegen, uh, Martin Arns, uh, do psychotherapy during TMS, uh, but 
I don't know if it's high frequency or if it is uh, low frequency. With uh, low frequency uh, protocol, it's uh, much easier. Yeah, he's doing it in low frequency. La low frequency uh, uh, n'est pas utilisé. Uh, low frequency is not used. Or rather, there's no protocol using low frequency and psychotherapy at the same time. Uh, I mean, to my knowledge, I don't think that there's such a thing. So you, uh, I suppose that you go for high frequency stimulation on the MPFC, um, or do you prefer low frequency? I think that we don't have any evidence that low frequency is effective, really, generally speaking. And I think this is true also in the cocaine population. Okay. I have a... Oh, there is a question. So maybe I missed it, but can you comment on any side effects uh, of the stimulation? Specifically, if this were not treatment-seeking individuals, they may be using other substances as well. So did the craving reduction, was it specific in any way, or did it also affect other behaviors associated with perhaps seeking other drugs or other types of compulsive behaviors? Yeah, I, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice. I think that's, that's a, a great question that I wish we could answer better. I wish it was easy to study uh, people who use multiple substances at once. Um, it becomes an issue of sort of controlling, right, the actual trial and what the outcome measures are and what is doing what, right? Um, in this particular, this human lab trial is easy to do that because you're regulating everything they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. This is going to be more difficult in translating it to a, a, a clinical trial. And certainly people that are using multiple substances, it's going to be more difficult to understand um, what exactly the treatment is doing. Now, in this case, people can be uh, cigarette smokers, they can drink alcohol or use other substances, but we do have some criteria um, that are mostly related to safety, but also to understanding its efficacy for treating cocaine specifically, right? The, the major concern is seizures, as I mentioned. Um, it is a very low likelihood, but the times when seizures have occurred, when people are sleep deprived, people who use cocaine are sometimes sleep deprived, um, when people are in alcohol withdrawal, people that use cocaine also often drink alcohol. Um, and um, trying to think of other other medications, right, that that maybe reduce the seizure threshold. So these are all things that have to be very tightly controlled in a research study that do make it difficult then to really understand in the, the clinical world once it moves beyond that. Okay, d'autres Right, are there, other, are there other questions or comments or statements? I have a last question. Maybe I missed something, but do you control the executive control before and after with something else but the drug strip test? Is it your only test? Uh, yes, it will be in this study. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly you could do a number of neuro, you know, neuropsychological tests. Um, again, I've sat through some of those and watched participants do them, and they're very, very challenging, right, for participants. Um, and I think what we need to understand is what's actually happening in the brain, right? And some of the studies that Dr. Zangen showed, you know, I hope that um, we can demonstrate that as well in this, in this trial. Okay. Uh, well, now is your time uh, for us to thank you for your great presentations, Mr. Blevins, also uh, Mr. Zangin. We want to thank Abraham Zangin for his presentation uh, directly from Israel. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. And, uh, well, we hope to see you soon. Thank you. And uh, also, we would like to thank you in the public because you uh, believe in the development of neurostimulation in the field of addictions. As far as I'm concerned, I'm of course convinced of interest and think that Christophe is also convinced, but we still have a lot of work to do. With that, I thank you very much and I wish you a very nice evening. Thank you.